one of the most colorful generals in the uh, Second World War, wore a pearl-handled revolver and used language that made the army blush. <laughs> and uh, you probably know who he is, the one and only General George Patton. I don't know where Patton is now, and none of us have the right or can tell whether a person has gone to be with God or is not with God. So we don't know that, loved ones, and I'm not bringing Patton's name up this morning to make any comment on his relationship to God. <coughs> But I think there were some things that happened in his life that God wants to use in our lives. And in order to really share with you what God has shown me, I have to use Patton's own words, even though they may be very offensive to you and you may just never come back to this place again. I find them very difficult because I didn't have great trouble with swearing. That wasn't one of the many sins that I had problems with in my life. But uh, yet you know that Patton uh, spoke that way. The, there are two incidents that I'd like to share with you, and I believe God wants to show us something through them. The first occurred during a press conference when a reporter put one of those personal questions to Patton and said, General, it's said back home that you read the Bible every day. Is that true? And Patton, of course, in typical Patton style, said, Sure, it's true. I read the goddamn Bible every day. And I know that we think, oh, no, no, that's, that's bad even to repeat that. And yet, loved ones, it is true, isn't it, that many people do use swear words without really knowing what they're saying. And it's true that whatever is motives for doing it, or whatever the results came from it, he did read the Bible every day. And we need to be a little careful ourselves that we don't put ourselves in the same corner as the Pharisees. And we don't laud our own freedom from swearing. And we don't look down on his use of language and yet be in the position where we ourselves do not read the Bible every day. Because if we do that, we put ourselves in the position of the Pharisees whom Jesus spoke to and said, you strain at a gnat. You complain about somebody using language differently from the way you do, but you swallow a camel. You yourselves don't read my word. So will you just keep that in mind as we go on to the second incident? The second incident occurred during the winter campaign of the Second World War when Patton was put in charge of the relief of Bastogne. And he had planned for the next day a surprise attack, which depended absolutely and utterly on being able to move his troops very fast. That night, the rain was bucketing down from the heavens. And the whole, it seemed that Europe was floating away. The roads were mud baths, and nobody could move any piece of equipment. And Patton called for the chaplain. 
and he said, Chaplain, I need a weather prayer. And the chaplain said, what did you say, General? And Patton said, I, I need you to write a weather prayer, you know, a, a prayer for favorable weather tomorrow. And the chaplain said, retreating, as we religious people are so good at, into the cover of his own theology, he said, well, General, I, I don't think the Almighty would appreciate a, a prayer for favorable weather so that we might kill our fellow man. And Patton said, Chaplain, I'm on personal terms with the Almighty. You write a good prayer and he'll answer. <laughs> you who know the course of the Second World War know that the next day the sun was shining and uh, Patton moved all his troops out and the battle was won. Now, the moral of the story is not that you should read the Bible and swear and write weather prayers. <laughs> it isn't. And it certainly isn't that you should fight wars and that war is right. And it certainly isn't that you should treat God as a magician to answer all your daily needs. But loved ones, the moral of the story is this, that God makes himself real and reveals himself, not to those who philosophize and fantasize about him, but to those who engage and trust him in the everyday actions and events of their lives. And too many of us here know and understand better than Patton ever did why we should read the Bible every day, but he did, and we don't. Too many of us here this morning know and understand better than Patton ever did why we can trust God in every practical situation that we face in our lives. But he was so sure that he could do that, that he based the movement of thousands of troops and materiel on God's faithfulness in answering prayer. Whereas many of us wouldn't base even one little step in our career on that faithfulness. That's why there are many religious people to whom God is very unreal. And it's strange, there are many religious people to whom God is very real. Because God reveals himself and manifests himself to those who engage and trust him in the actual events and actions of their everyday lives, not to those who study about them and philosophize about them and think about them. Do you see, that's exactly what happened to the dear Jews. They have been the experts on religion from the world began because God chose them to tell about himself so that they could tell the rest of the world. So at their mother's knees, every Jew heard about God's faithfulness. How when their forefathers were traveling from Egypt to Israel through the wilderness, God made miraculous bread-like food appear on the ground every morning a manna that fed hundreds and thousands of Israelites right through the wilderness. At their mother's knees, they heard about how God broke down the walls of the city of Jericho so that the Israelite army could move in and destroy an army that was three, four times its size. 
They had heard too for years about how untrustworthy man is, how their predecessors had repeatedly resorted to their own ways and to the counterfeit gods of their neighbors, often the very moment after God had brought some great deliverance to them. The Jews knew these things. They had more knowledge and understanding than anybody else of how much you could trust God to come through in your everyday life needs and how it was absolutely madness to try to run your life by your own ideas or by depending on the favorable actions of other human beings. They knew better than anybody else that the only way to live life and the only way in which God could become real to you was to trust him in life's everyday situations. They knew that God was going to send his own unique servant to the earth someday. They knew that. They knew that there was a Messiah coming whom in places they read in their prophets God would call actually his son. They knew that this person would come to earth and that he would change their untrusting, independent hearts and would provide them with personalities that were able to trust God day by day. They knew these things. Isaiah had described to them how this man would be despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, that he wouldn't even speak back when he was charged by the, the, the judges. They knew from Ezekiel that this man would give us a new spirit and a new heart within us and would take away from us our heart of flesh. They knew all these things. And yet those dear Jews did not recognize this Messiah that they had been looking for and expecting for years when he came. When he came, instead of taking part in the religious games that they had begun to devise, because that's what they did, instead of taking all this knowledge and understanding that their parents passed on to them and using it to trust God in the everyday events of their lives, instead of that, they turned the whole thing into a religious game of temple worship and of certain laws that this person had to obey and that person had to obey. So that when Jesus came and refused to take part in preoccupation with their temple ritual and abstruse arguments about the law, they didn't recognize him. This one that they had been looking for for so long. Because he talked to ordinary people, telling them, look, don't worry about the things that you're facing. Don't worry what you're going to wear. Don't worry what you're going to eat. Your heavenly Father knows you need those things, and he's going to provide them for you. So what you need to do is enjoy his love for you and then share the free gifts of his love with other people freely. That's what you have to do. They didn't recognize this non-religious man who came with such down-to-earth common-sense teaching. And instead, they missed him completely. And so, loved ones, the religious Jews missed the Messiah when he came, and the non-religious Gentiles rose to this and began to live that way. And do you realize that the early church, therefore, was a Gentile church? Do you know that? The early church was not a Jewish church, except for the few disciples and some others. The early church was a Gentile church because the Jews had expected a religious leader who would be preoccupied with religious things. The Gentiles rose to a person who told them that trusting God and him being real to them was a matter of day-to-day, everyday events and actions that they were to com combine with him in taking part in. And here's the way Paul puts it, if you, if you look at it. It's Romans 10, and it's the, it's the one piece that I'd ask you to look at. Romans 10 and verse 18. 
And Paul is talking about the, the Jews. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have. For their voice has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. So Israel certainly has heard and knows about God. Again I ask, did Israel not understand? First Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation I will make you angry. And then in verse 20, the one we're studying today, then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. God became real to the people who were not preoccupied with finding him in the form that they had been worshiping for years. He was found by the Gentiles. I think a lot of us here this morning are here because we've honestly been seeking God and trying to make him real in our lives for years. But loved ones, do you know it's very easy to turn that into a kind of religious chess game? where you concentrate on making the right moves and avoiding the wrong moves, where you get preoccupied with techniques of prayer or tricks of believing, or you get all taken up with how much sin is consistent in the life of a Christian. It's very easy to turn the whole thing into a religious game. And God will never become real to you in that. God becomes real to you in a different arena completely. In the arena of everyday life. It's in that arena, arena of robust faith that God makes himself real to you. But I sometimes think that many of us here are most defensive and most apologetic when it comes to our interaction with God in that arena. We're prepared to deal with him in this arena. We're prepared to talk about him, philosophize, think about him, read books about him. But when it comes to dealing with him in the arena of Monday to Friday and moving out on limbs of faith as old Patton did, then we're apologetic and defensive and we say, well, now, you, you can't expect me to do that. I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying, you know. What I'd love to share with you this morning is don't get paranoid over the fact that it's a sin not to do that. Forget that for a moment. Forget the business that it's a sin. The fact is you're missing God by not doing it. You're missing God. You're missing the reality of God in your life. That's why he isn't real to you. Because you keep them boxed up in a little religious set of philosophies and thinking. But when it comes to trusting him for Good weather for the battle the next day, you say, no, no. You kind of theologize your way out of it. Whether that's right or wrong is not the issue. Don't you see that? The issue is, do you live like that day by day? Do you worry about money or your job or certain people? that you have to deal with. Do you worry? God said, don't be anxious for anything, but by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known unto me. Stop sulking and saying, I'm trying to do that. Stop saying, well, I know I should do that, and I know it's a sin not to do it. Stop that. Do it. Commit the thing to God. Stop this minute worrying about your money. Commit it to God. Write your weather prayer and leave it with God and have done with it. That's what faith is. It's in that kind of faith 
that God answers. Just stop worrying about the money. That person that you think has taken advantage of you, stop thinking about that person. Commit that person into God's hands and say, Lord, I trust you to take care of whatever he's able to destroy. Just do it. That's what faith is. Commit it into God's hands and go forward rejoicing. Do you tithe? Do you, do you give a tenth of your money to God? Stop debating about it. Stop discussing whether it's enough or whether it should be after tax dollars or before tax dollars. <laughs> Stop your religious pharisaical games Stop trying to control the thing by saying, well, well, no, but I like to give it where I want to control it, you know, because that's not giving it. That's just extending your own ability to do things. Stop all that silliness. Give the tenth. Get rid of it fast. I don't care whether it goes into this plate or some other plate. Get rid of it. Throw it, throw it away. Throw it into the garbage can. But obey. Commit yourself. Trust. Take a step. Loved ones, faith is not debating whether a tithe is right or wrong. Faith is not discussing what will be done with the tithe. Faith is not even doing the calculating to find out what the tithe is. Faith is dividing your salary by 10 and plonking that many dollars somewhere, anywhere, but get rid of it. Faith is action. And in action, God begins to become real to you. Are you worried about your future? About your marriage? Or about the way your career is going? Or about where you're going to live? God said, commit your way unto the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. Do that. Stop sulking and being surly and saying, oh, well, if you weren't married, you'd be worried too. I mean, this society makes it very hard for a girl not to be married, or it makes it very hard for a guy to find the right girl. Stop that silly sulking and trust God. When you see a fella like Patton, I don't know where he is, but when you see the dear fella going out like that in action, doesn't your heart rise? Don't you feel, yeah, I'd love to do that kind of thing. I'd love to live it instead of talking about it eternally. Well, do it. Stop looking for a partner. Stop watching for some guy to look at you or some girl to look at you. Stop hoping that this guy or that guy will give you the job you want. Stop that stuff. Stop depending on people and events and outside forces. Trust God. Commit it into his hands and live rejoicingly. Faith is action. If you say to me, I can't do it, sure you can. You go into a room, you find your eyes going over to that girl, take your eyes off that girl. That's it. It's no problem. Same with those of us who are concerned about jobs. We know it, how you speak nicely to this guy because you think he'll help you. Stop doing that. Just stop doing that. Faith is not some kind of terrible inner struggle. That terrible inner struggle is your refusal to have faith. That's what it is. It's not a struggle to have faith. It's your refusal to trust God. Faith itself is action. Coming up to the River Jordan, am I going to walk into that thing? Am I not? I am. I go into it. Faith is not saying, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking that I'm walking into it. Oh, yeah. Boy, those, that water feels cold. Oh. <laughs> It's not. Faith is walking in. Faith is action. Loved ones, that's what the verse means. God made himself real to those who were not seeking him simply because they trusted him in everyday events. And he revealed himself to those who did not ask for him simply because they responded to his words in Jesus, trust me as your loving father and walk rejoicingly. Enter into great enterprises of faith for me. Enter into the great robust arena of action and faith. 
and I will make myself real to you. Loved ones, it'll do your heart good if you'd start living that way. It really would. Because the other stuff is sick, 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 sick. It really is. And it would do you the world of good if you'd stop all this internalizing and this meditating and this thinking and you'd begin to see the simple fact that you were made by a dear loving father who cares about your life more than you care about it yourself and he has the whole thing planned and if you trust him and concentrate on pleasing him and loving him and live rejoicing every day, your life will be a success in his eyes, whatever it's like in others. I would pray that some of you will step out into faith and into a reality of God this very day. Let's pray. Dear Father, we don't know where the dear man is, but we do thank you for men like Patton and others who, whether they intended these truths or not, were able somehow to be a channel for you to show us what it is like to live a robust life of faith with you instead of this weak and watery life of religious thinking and meditation. Lord, we pray that you'd show us each one right now what particular thing we have to go out on a limb of faith for now and turn into your hands and forget forever. Lord, show us whatever that is. If there's anything eating away at somebody's dear heart here in this room, Lord, will you show them that that's none of their business. That's your business. And enable them to turn it over to you and stop pulling themselves further down into depression by trying to deal with something that they cannot deal with. And then, Lord, will you show us most of all where you want us to go out on limbs of faith, not simply to take bastone or to take some land from some human enemy, but to take this world back from the enemy that has taken control. Will you show us each one how to begin the great robust enterprise of a faith life to bring this dear world into a knowledge of you. Lord Jesus, we want to be like you. We want to be healthy, robust, outgoing people who trust their God in the everyday life and actions of their own existence. We ask you, Lord, to show us where we have to do that, and then we'll obey. And we know, Lord God, that you will at last become real to us. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us now and evermore. Amen.